we're now going to start working on the ABBA case. My main focus for this case is going to be on the process you go through before you even put finger to keypad to start writing up the case, to start typing up the case. I'd like to go through the stages prior to that, and that'll be my main focus. We'll spend a little bit of time on writing up the case, but that won't be our main focus. The first thing you do with any case is, of course, read the case and do an outline. That's a very, very critical step in the process, because it's in that step that you're going to identify the required, the issues, et cetera, and that will have a huge, huge impact on how you perform on the case. So I'd like to give you practice now in reading a case and doing the outline. The case I've given you to do ABBA is a short case. It's a 70-minute case, and I'd say it's shorter than the average 70-minute case. We said that normally you would have a third to a quarter of your time to do the outline. This is the sort of case where people will be much closer. By the time you get to September, many people could easily do it in about a quarter of the time. I would say that many people could do it in maybe 17, 18 minutes quite easily, leaving over the remainder of the time to write the case because it's a fairly short 70-minute case. However, this is the first case we're working on in this program. So I don't want to worry about speed when it comes to the first outline you've ever done. So what I'd like you to do now is read the case and put together an outline without worrying about speed. Just read carefully and do the best job you can. I'll give you at least 25 minutes, and if you need more time, I'll give you more time. As you do the outline, guys, remember to put down the required and leave space between each required. Then insert the issues underneath the required. Keep track of the salient facts, the important facts, by either putting them on your outline or try to make maximum use of cross-referencing when there's lots of facts. These last two points, users and objectives and critical success factors, are not relevant in the vast majority of cases. So if you think they're relevant here, put them on your outline. Otherwise, don't. Give it a shot, guys. Give it the best shot you can. Doing a good outline comes with practice. I'm first going to give you a chance to put together your own outline. And then what I'll do is I'll walk through the case with you, and I'll show you exactly how I would have done my own outline. When you're doing your outline, guys, keep in mind, perfectly fine to make little notes in the margin. It's a very good thing to do. You'll see that I do that when I do my outline. Very good idea. Underline extraneous information or background slash extraneous information. You'll see that I do that when I do my outline. And try to come up with the best outline you can. We'll start the take up of the outline. We'll start walking through the case after you finish this. And I'll show you how I would have done my outline. We'll probably only get through a small part of my outline today. And we'll get through the remainder of my outline tomorrow. So it's now about 103. So take about 25 minutes. If you need more time, I'll be happy to give you more time. Speak to you soon. What I would like to do now is I'd like to show you how I would have done my own outline. And the way I'm going to do this is as follows. I'm going to read through the case with you and I'm going to pretend I'm a student who's never seen this case before. So when I read the first page, I have no idea what's coming up on future pages, just like any other student. I will show you exactly what I take to my outline. You will see my outline on the side of the page. Obviously in real life, I'm not doing my outline on the side of the exam page. I'm doing it on a plain piece of paper. But for presentation purposes, you'll see it appear on the side of my slide. I'll also show you exactly what I would have underlined in the case, but I find that highlighting shows up better in a PowerPoint than underlining. So whatever you see me highlighting in real life, I would underline. Now, again, if you prefer to highlight, that's fine too. But, purpose, but for my own purposes, personally, I prefer underlining. Whatever you see highlighted, I would really be underlining in real life. I'll also show you the notes that I put in the margin. Remember I mentioned that I often put notes in the margin? I'll show you that. I'll also show you what I would have underlined in terms of the extraneous slash background information. Most importantly, I'll share my thought process with you. I will tell you exactly what I'm thinking every step of the way. If you have any questions as I go along, please stop me. Okay, so let me get started. UCPA are one of two partners in a firm of chartered accountants in a small region or town in Western Canada. Susan Adams is a businesswoman and an old friend of yours from high school days back east. She moved to the mountain several years ago to enjoy life as a ski bum and discovered she had a talent for sales. Now, I did not do anything with that because there's not really much to do with it, so I did nothing. 
The next thing they mention is Susan is now 31 years of age. Now, when I read that, some of you might have underlined that as background information, tells you something about the owner. If you did, that's perfectly fine. I didn't underline it, but it would certainly be fine to underline it. When it comes to underlining background slash extraneous information, it's a judgment call. No two people will necessarily underline exactly the same thing. Any questions so far? Let's continue reading. It then goes on to say, she opened a local retail store, head for the mountains three years ago, and has been operating it successfully ever since. When I read that, I now I'm learning a little bit about her business, and they go on to explain to me what the business involves. It says, HML sells high-end clothing and accessories for outdoor enthusiasts. That's the sort of thing that I would underline. Remember I said to you, background information is often on the nature of the company, might be on the nature of the industry. Here they're telling me a little bit about the nature of HML. What do they do? HML sells high-end clothing and accessories for outdoor enthusiasts. That I would underline as background slash extraneous information. Goes on to say you've obtained the most recently completed statements of HML as well as details of the company's operations, and then they refer to an exhibit. Guys, I never run to the exhibit as I'm reading the main body. If you do that, you will lose your train of thought. You're much, much better off just waiting till you get to it because you don't want to lose your train of thought as you're reading the main body. There's absolutely no need to read the exhibit right now. It then goes on to say, you've always prepared the tax returns for HML on the basis of financial statements provided by Susan. Now, when I read this, I have no idea why they're telling it to me. I don't even know my role yet. Don't know the required. I have no idea why this is relevant. Why am I underlining it, guys? Because it's extremely unlikely they would tell me who does the returns, who does the statements, and it turns out to be totally irrelevant. I mentioned that there isn't much in the way of red herrings on this exam. They don't give you useless information to throw you off. It's just not the nature of the beast. So if they go to the trouble of telling me that you always prepare the returns, Susan prepares the statements, it's likely to be relevant. I don't know why at this stage, because I haven't read enough, but I know it's likely to be relevant, and therefore I underline it. It then goes on to say on May 15th, 2017, Susan meets with you to discuss a possible expansion. Now, you'll notice that I circled where we are in time, May 15th, 2017. When it comes to dates, guys, you want to keep track of them. They're very important on this exam. Some people like to use a timeline. Some people just circle them, but always keep track of them. There are two dates that are very important, particularly important, to the extent that in addition to underlining or putting it on my, to in addition to circling or putting it on a timeline, I would also imprint it on my brain. What are the two dates that I would imprint on my brain and keep in the back of my mind throughout my reading of the case? The two dates that are most critical, where am I in time, and what's the financial statement date? Those two dates, not only would I put them on a timeline at, or circle them, but I would keep them in the back of my mind. Sometimes where you are in time can have an impact on the issues. You'll see that that's the case for ABBA. It's not always the case, but it's the case for ABBA. The financial statement date is very important because when you're dealing with financial accounting, you always want to know, did the transaction take place before or after the year end? So it's very important to not just circle or put it on a timeline, but always have it in the back of your mind. Obviously, there are many other dates that you need to keep track of, but those two, in my mind, are the most key. So let's take a look at the case again. On May 15th, 2017, Susan meets with you to discuss a possible expansion. Susan begins, I've been asked by the manufacturers of ABBA clothing, and they go on to tell you that it's a European company. I apologize that my highlighting is coming out a little bit above the word. I don't know why. It should, this highlight should, should be on top of the word European company. I would, have under, I would have underlined the fact that it's a European company. The reason why I would have underlined that it's a European company is very simple. It's classic extraneous information. It's telling me about the location of ABBA. At this stage, would I have any idea why it's relevant? Of course not. But I underline it, and if I don't use that information before I re finish reading the case, I'll come back to it after the case and ask myself why it's relevant. You'll see that it will turn out to be very relevant that ABBA is in Europe. It might not become obvious today, but it will certainly become obvious by tomorrow. Let's continue. I've been asked by the manufacturer of ABBA clothing, European company, so I've underlined that, 
to open a retail st store in the small resort town where I reside. And now they give me information on the nature of ABBA. They say ABBA manufactures trendy clothing for outdoor enthusiasts. Another example of extraneous information, they're giving me information on the nature of ABBA and is attempting to increase the distribution of its products by establishing ABBA retail stores across Canada and the U.S. I'll tell you what's going through my mind at this point. because I'm, The whole point of this exercise is not just to show you how I do the outline, but to also share my thought process. What's going through my mind at this point is ABBA seems very similar to HML. HML sells high-end clothing accessories for outdoor enthusiasts. ABBA manufactures trendy clothing for outdoor enthusiasts. So they seem similar. But at this stage, I have no idea why that's relevant. There's no way I can know that at this stage because I don't know the required yet. Once I know at least some of the required, I might be in a position to determine why this is relevant. Let's move on now to the next paragraph. The next paragraph begins, and I apologize, the bolding should be over the, should be over the words, ABBA is anxious to reach an agreement before the end of May, because I would have underlined that. When I read that, what's going through my mind is, boy, that's soon. It's already May 15th, so in two weeks they want to reach an agreement? That seems very soon. Since it'll have to manufacture additional product over the summer to meet the plan store opening of September 1st, 017. Now we finally come to the required. I don't know whether this new opportunity is likely to be successful and would like you to consider whether on an overall basis, it would be a good business move to acquire an ABBA franchise. I value your keen business acumen as well as your ability to calculate whether the expansion would be viable. This is a major move or major business move for me, so I'd appreciate a report from you addressing the expansion. Now, guys, that's quite a mouthful. So what did I do at this stage? At this stage, I put down my first required. Determine whether ABBA opportunity is likely to be successful. This is exactly what I'm putting on my outline at the top of the outline. Overall, good move. That's at the very top of my outline. Then I put down a sub-required. Calculate viability of expansion. How did I know that calculating the viability of the expansion is a sub-required? Because it says it directly. It says I value your keen business acumen as well as your ability to calculate whether the expansion would be viable. So clearly, I have to calculate the viability of the expansion. Now, the other thing I would do is I would leave some space. I always leave space between required and sub-required. And the next thing I would write down is qualitative analysis. Uh, Alvin, I'll come back to your case in a moment, your question in a moment, okay? The other thing I would do is I would start another subheading, qualitative analysis. So I leave space between the two sub-required and I put down qualitative analysis. Nowhere in this case, nowhere in this case, did they ask you to deal with a qualitative analysis. What made me put that down? What made me think of the fact then I'm also going to have to do a qualitative analysis of the expansion. Can somebody tell me? Alvin says strategic alignment. Good point. Anything else? You need balance in the analysis. Very good, Crystal. Guys, there are a number of hints that I better do a qualitative analysis. Number one, she doesn't just want you to number crunch. She makes it very clear. I value your keen business acumen, you know, I, if you basically, I'd appreciate your report addressing the possible expansion. There's no way you can advise on an expansion just based on numbers. What you'll find on the CV is that any time you're making a major business decision, it can never be made just based on numbers. You always need a qualitative analysis too. The qualitative analysis will usually fall under strategy and governance because you're typically dealing with pros and cons or risks and opportunities. So just keep in mind that you never make a business, major business decision without a quality of analysis. Here it's particularly obvious because she even says, I'd like you to consider whether on an overall basis it's a good business move. So she wants more than just numbers, and she values your keen business acumen. But in general, I would always have some qualitative analysis. I would never, ever make up my mind just based on the numbers. And again, a number of people gave me really good answers. I'm not going to read them all, but that's the basic gist of why you need to deal with qualitative analysis. Now, the next paragraph I didn't do anything with. It just refers to an exhibit or an appendix. I'll deal with it when the time comes. And by the way, I'm using the term appendix and exhibit interchangeably. They're the same thing. 
once I know what the required is, I can now come back to what we read in the first two paragraphs. In the first two paragraphs, we were told about the nature of ABBA's business compared with HML. I said to you before that I noticed the two businesses were similar, but before I knew what the required was, I had no idea why that was relevant. Now that I know that I'm going to be advising on the acquisition, now I know that it is relevant. So my question for you is, why is it relevant? How does it affect your advice? Is it good that they're similar? Is it bad? Is it both good and bad? What do you think, guys? What do you think? Obviously, I would make use of that information when I do my qualitative analysis. Why is it relevant that they're similar? What do you think? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it both? Let's take a look here, guys. So Yiddy said, okay, let me, let's take a look here. So Yiddy says, um, goes into your qualitative analysis to determine if there's expertise to operate the franchise. Excellent. So the positive side here is she likely has some expertise given the similarity of the businesses. But then a number of you point out, again, I apologize, I can't get to everybody, but so I, I, I won't have to be able to read every comment. So don't take it personally, please. Um, Yidi says, or Giselle says, excuse me, could eat into your current sales. There's a positive and a negative. The positive is she has the expertise. The negative is it could eat into her current sales. It could cannibalize current sales, okay? Uh, Tahira mentions there could be synergy. So that synergy is diversification, which he mentions could be good or bad, but I can certainly see the good in a synergy. Um, I see Corey points to the fact of synergies and uh, familiarity, which is the same thing as expertise, okay? Bottom line is I can't go through, every, through everybody's answer, but at the end of the day, what was very important was to realize that there's good and bad here. You always want a balanced answer if at all possible. So rather than just saying it's no good because of cannibalization or it's great because she's familiar with it in the synergies, I've mentioned both sides. All that I write on my outline, however, is just a few words. I just wrote down ABBA similar to HML. I didn't write anything more than that. That will be enough to jog my memory. When you do your outline, guys, you need to write enough to remind yourself of what you want to talk about. Yeah, you're going to be following this outline when it comes time to write up the case. So you need to write enough to remind yourself of what you want to say. When I wrote down ABBA similar to HML, that's enough to remind me to talk about the issue of cannibalization, expertise, synergy, etc. That's enough for me. Your outline has to be for you. So some people would have written a couple of extra words. Some people might have written on their outline, ABBA similar to HML, dash expertise, or dash familiarity, or dash cannibalization. Write what you need to write to jog your own memory. I just want to take a look. Somebody wrote me a long chat. I just want to make sure uh, it's covered. Right. So again, I was just reading that chat, but it's right on the ball. Scott, you're 100% correct in what you're saying. I don't want to read it because it's basically very correct. Scott, again, is addressing the issue of cannibalization. Okay. Another point that I would have put down on my outline is the timing. They told us that it's already May 15th, and ABBA wants to close the deal by the end of May. I certainly would have commented on the fact that it's too quick. Two weeks is not enough time to close the deal. Now, I mentioned earlier, guys, I mentioned earlier that it can be very important to take into account where you are in time. So you have to remember, and it wasn't too difficult here because you just read it a paragraph earlier, that it's already May 15th. Two weeks is not a long time to sign an agreement. I mentioned during the lecture that one of the differences between a competent and a reach and competence response is the competent candidate doesn't just state something but always provides his or her reasoning. Why is it, why is two weeks not enough time? Don't assume the reasoning is obvious, always give the reasoning. Why is two weeks not enough time? It's obvious, guys, but you get a lot of credit for stating the obvious. Excellent. Giselle says, how are you going to get your due diligence done in two weeks? So it wouldn't be good enough just to say they're rushing you, there's not enough time. It would be important to explain why. There isn't enough time to get our due diligence done so we can make sure it's a good business. Some people might have also put down, and if you thought of this, it's a valid point. I'm a little suspicious when the seller's trying to rush me. 
Are they trying to hide something? Maybe they don't want me to do due diligence so, so, so thoroughly. Now, I realize they gave you an ostensible reasoning to store opening, but nevertheless, you never know. One person, by the way, when I asked for qualitative points, mentioned lower audit risk. I just want to make it clear, audit risk would not be an issue here because we're not dealing with any audit required, right? There is no audit required here. Guys, this is what my outline would look like by the time I finish reading my first page, my first page of the case. This is all that's on my outline. I don't want to stop in the middle of an exhibit, so I'd rather not start the first exhibit today because we'll stop right in the middle, which is never a good thing. So what I'd like to do is tomorrow begin with the first exhibit. And once again, we'll walk through this together and I will show you again what I put on my outline, what I underline, what I scribble down on the paper, and most importantly, I'll share with you my thought process. Let me just, I believe that earlier on, there was a question from Alvin that I never answered. So let me go back to it now. Okay, I assume he still has the question. Just going back to it, it's quite a bit up in my, uh, let me just read it. It's quite long, so if you don't mind, I'll just read it to myself and then I'll explain what the question is. Okay, it's an excellent question, guys. Uh, um, what, what, I don't know if I'm getting your name right. Oh, it's AJ, sorry, it's not Alvin, it's AJ. Okay, AJ, uh, AJ says that he doesn't know why I keep saying, as I was reading through the case, I was saying earlier, I don't know the required. I was basically saying until I got to this paragraph here, until I got to the second to last paragraph, I didn't know the required. So he says, but we already knew earlier that Susan wants to discuss a possible expansion. So obviously that means she wants to know if she should do it or not. Um, AJ, the reason why I said what I said is I still didn't know exactly what our role was going to be. Um, usually they're a little more explicit than that. Usually they'll tell you a little more clearly what they want you to do. So at the end of the day, you're 100% right. I had a very strong suspicion. I had a very, very strong suspicion uh, already in paragraph two of what I would need to do. But I'm still waiting to get a direct required because usually it would be pretty rare for them just to say she wants to discuss a possible expansion and say nothing more. Almost always they'll give you, you know, a, 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 uh, a clearer required than that. So I'm waiting to get a clear required before I decide how to use the information. Okay. Is, is that clear, uh, AJ? Is that clear? Okay. So AJ, I just want to make it clear. I already had a suspicion even before I got to the third paragraph as to why the similarity of the businesses would be relevant. But I just didn't want to jump the gun because based on the nature of this exam, I know there's more to come. It, as I say, this, would be, this just would not be definitive enough to be a required on the CP, just based on my past experience. So I know there's more that's likely to come. Guys, before we end today's session, are there any questions? Any questions, guys, before we end today's session? Okay, so if there are no questions, what I would like to do is end today's session. And as I said, tomorrow we'll begin going through the appendices, and I'll complete my outline. Oh, so let's see if I have another, I believe I have something else here. Um, again, um, I, don't, I don't think you'll be able, AJ, AJ mentions that in some of the cases he's done, the asks are more implicit, but they're never this implicit, at least not on the CP. Uh, again, I don't want you to look at the CPs yet, it's too early, but I've looked at all the CPs so far. I've yet to see a CP where it was this open-ended, where it was this vague. And it's just not the nature of the way the CP is being, okay? Again, I, I, I don't want to show that to you right now because I don't want to spoil it for you. I don't think you're ready to look at the CPs yet, right? You want to save that. But once you start looking at the CPs, you'll see it's just not the nature of the beast. Any other questions, guys? The cases you're referring to, I doubt, uh, are CPs, are real CPs. Any other, um, any other questions? Okay. So if there are no other questions, let's call it a day. And uh, we'll resume tomorrow at 11 o'clock. There's nothing for you to do between today and tomorrow. Okay. Oh, AJ says they were very, they were Ivy type cases. Yeah. Oh, sorry, AJ. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, very, <laughs> I like your point there. Okay. I apologize. I didn't realize you were, you know, that's one thing that, that's hard to do when I don't see people. 
Um, so AJ, you're right. If they were IV cases, I'm a, I agree with you completely. IV cases are more similar to the cases I did when I was in my MBA, which are far, far more undirected than CD cases. Okay, so you're very welcome, guys. And um, I really look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, enjoy the remainder of your day. Take care, everybody.